Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the first session of Think Floyd stage. Uh, my name is Ostea, but you can call me Tea. That's a bit easier. I'm going to be chaperoning you and our speakers today. And without further ado, I guess we can begin. Uh, we are starting with Tobias Gorachel, and this is what we know about him. Tobias started his career as a freelance web developer in 1997 and has since worked on hundreds of smaller and larger projects from a few days to several years in a var variety of roles, contexts and industries. He is a survivor of no less than three major technology hypes and eventually decided to focus on topics with a less volatile lifespan, lean, agile, software crafting and DevOps. Having found a home as a consultant, crafter, and coach at CodeCentric in 2014, he strives to help customers to build and improve not only their product, but also how it is made. He is a passionate advocate for collaborative work environments, knowledge sharing, and diversity. Tobias is a father of two and loves music, books, movies, and little dogs. Now let's hear choking the monolith, the strangler pattern applied. Word to you, Tobias. Hey, welcome. Uh, thank you for that very long introduction. That's actually quite outdated, but um, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm going to try to do it justice anyway. Um, so um, yeah, hundreds of projects. That's true. Actually, I started with uh, with advertising. So you know, those projects um, usually take about a week or two. Um, that's where all that experience comes from. Um, more recently, I've been involved in projects where basically very large enterprise uh, companies will try to replace their system that's been running for 40 years uh, with something that vaguely resembles um, a modern cloud application. And that's actually where this talk comes from, um, which you can tell by, um, you know, choking the monolith, uh, you know, that monolith thing that kind of uh, evokes the kind of feeling where basically this is in your head. Right. Um, so it's 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 kind of your kid. Um, you've grown attached to it, but at the same time, it makes you want to go why you little and strangle it all the time. Um, but it turns out that's actually absolutely not what the strangler pattern is about. So let's forget that. Um, I get the feeling, but um, let's try to be more patient and and do the monolith more justice because actually they're not so bad. So um, the name strangler pattern comes from something that's the, called the strangler fig. So it's actually not quite the violent um, reaction that you will have to uh, legacy code that um, that's meant by this, but it's actually this really interesting plant. Um, it grows in Australia, as you can see by the photo credit. Um, there's actually quite a lot of uh, different uh, species of strangler figs, but this one's very, you know, you, you can pretty much see what it's about. So it's a, it's a plant that starts growing from the outside of another tree. So it's a tree that grows on trees. Um, it'll start life somewhere in the middle of the trunk of the, of the host tree. And then the, uh, the roots are going to crawl down the original tree, eventually reach the soil. Um, it'll grow more rigid, it'll build more structure, it'll start taking all the water from the soil, it'll start taking all the nutrients from the soil. And when it's really big and strong and it's completely enclosed the original tree, that one will just die. You know, it'll just starve um, and basically wither inside the other one. But the strangler fig will continue to live. And um, so this, this pattern was named uh, by Martin Fowler in 2004 after this really interesting plant because it's really a way of replacing that original legacy application, that monolith that we hate so much, by a new system very slowly, very incrementally, until it eventually just goes away. Right? What it's not is a microservices pattern, even though it's often used in, uh, in a context where we are trying to uh, replace the original app with a microservice application. But it's not really that. It, you can use it pretty much for um, any um, uh, uh, programming paradigm, and it will still be somehow uh, applicable. Um, and in fact, we're going to get to that later on. So um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to where are we applying this pattern, um, then how are we applying it, um, what happens when we apply it, 
and what other patterns will work well in conjunction with it. And then I'm going to basically um, make a big question mark on all of this because when you're using it in real life, other things happen and all of a sudden it's not that easy. So that's what's going to happen. Um, so let's get into it. So basically any company, any larger company especially, that's been around for a while has legacy code. And usually we, we have, that has a bad name. We have a bad uh, feeling about legacy. It's uh, stuff that's somewhere in the basement. Um, we've inherited from other people. Usually, you know, the people who wrote it, that was like years ago, or maybe it was even another company that, um, that was working for, for our organization. Um, it's code that's usually not safe to change. Like, you know, anytime we touch it, stuff might break or we don't know whether it will break or, uh, you know, we're just not sure. Um, it's code that doesn't have tests. That's basically the uh, the definition that Michael Feathers uses, um, which kind of, you know, it, it, it comes close, but it's not quite accurate because sometimes there are tests, but it's still, you know, awkward to work with that. And... Um, and some other people might say that it's all code as soon as it's written, because basically once you've, you've, uh, you you turned your back, you, uh, it starts running, um, you, you forget about it, and all of a sudden it's legacy, right? All of this is very negative, and it's very, you know, it's a very one-sided way of looking at things. It's the the developer's way of looking at things, because you know when we have to touch it, we don't feel so good. But there's also another side of looking at this, and um, and this one's really important because legacy code is also the code that works, right? It's been around for a while, so it's basically running our business, and it contains all the knowledge by the people that originally wrote it and by the people that um, wrote the specification for it. So there's a lot of stuff that's really valuable in there, and um, some of the decisions that were made might have been wrong, but others, you know, they came around the same problems that you're going to face when you're writing a new application that's going to replace the original one. They made decisions based on experience, on experiments, on failing in other in other parts. So, you know, just throwing all that away is kind of dangerous too, right? Because it's it's the code that earns the money. It's the one that makes the business grow. And um, especially for those large kind of enterprise um, organizations that I've been working for the last couple of years, like banks and insurance companies. Um, this is literally code that's still running on mainframes written in COBOL 40 years ago. And, you know, the original programmers, you know, some of them have died in the meantime. So we don't really know how it came about, but it's the thing that's still running and everyone's afraid of touching that. So, yeah, on the one side, it's not so much a, a thing that we like to work on, but on the other hand, it's the thing that's really, really valuable. So if we need to replace it, there better be a good reason, right? Um, so there's some good reasons that happen. You know, uh, right now, we're basically in the middle of a huge paradigm shift where everyone goes from the app that runs on-premise on a single server or maybe two um, to cloud applications, you know, large scale, um, anywhere across the, the, the globe, it's global business, so everything changes, it's all distributed. You can't do that with that legacy stuff, or at least not as easily. So that's a pretty good reason to, you know, think about replacing things. Um, same for when the rules change, um, especially um, banks and, and insurance companies, are usually very prone to, to um, the law changing, right? So there's the new tax code, there's new stuff about um, documentation, there's new things about um, GDPR, all of that compliance comes into play, right? So we have to change it. Um, also, we might get lucky. So the business goes up um, instead of a couple of thousand users a day, we now have millions, right? And this old system is just not gonna keep up. or we're starting to see that the hosting the stuff on our own uh, premises and having our own servers and ha having people, employing people to make the stuff run, uh, it's really not so cost effective. So we might just use whatever the big uh, cloud environments will will give us and, and save some money. And then, of course, you know, if you have to make some changes and the original programmer died, it's pretty hard. 
right? So you have to find someone to replace them. You have to find someone with the sa same kind of skill set. Um, it's pretty hard to find COBOL program programmers these days. So uh, there might be good reasons on that part. Um, also, some of the stuff that we originally wrote ourselves might now be available as a product, so we can just buy it, right? So any kind of uh, financial applications. Um, usually, most of the, st the stuff that runs in banks is commodity now. So there might be a good reason to just say, well, let's throw away the old stuff and buy something that works for everyone else, right? Here's the strangler pattern. It's not the strangler pattern. So this is what you're thinking of. Don't. Right? It's not violent. It's the strangler fig pattern. It's named after this plant um, that I introduced before. Right, So it's a plant, a tree that grows on trees. It grows around the original tree, and eventually it starves the, the host off. So basically, it takes a very long time. It grows very slowly, and uh, it replaces the original tree with a new tree. And it's actually a really strong one, and it's, you know, it keeps living after the original host dies. Um, pattern was named by Martin Fowler in 2004, so it's been around for a while. Um, it's a pattern for replacing a legacy system incrementally. It's not a microservices pattern. Uh, it can be used with microservices, but it's not that. You can use it with any other way of replacing your original application. So where we will, will we apply it? Will we, we'll apply it for legacy code. It's, you know, um, I chose this picture for a reason, by the way. This is uh, an old bridge that's eventually been replaced by a new bridge. And you know, same as you can't tear the old bridge down and just start building a new one, because in the meantime, nobody will be able to, to get across the water. Same is true for legacy code. So it's, on the one hand, code that we don't like to touch um, because it's old, right? It's, it's starting to get cracks. It's uh, not doing. Um, we're not feeling safe with it anymore. We, especially, we're not safe in changing it. Um, there's no tests. It's you know stuff that other people wrote, so it's already not great. Um, but it's also the code that runs our system. Um, it's the code that makes the money. It's the code that contains all the knowledge of the people that wrote it, and um, and also the people that wrote the specifications for it. And it's usually been around for a while, so there's a lot of knowledge inside of it. And we don't just want to, you know, get rid of that without having a, an adequate replacement. So why would we need replacing it? Well, it's getting old, it's getting cracks, it's not running the same way anymore, yes. But also, we have better ways of building stuff now. We have, we're building cloud applications instead of um, old monolithic single server stuff. Um, the law changes. We have to go on and, and replace our system with something that matches the new laws better, right? So GDPR comes to mind. Um, we're also increasing our business, right? Instead of a thousand users per day, we have a million. So we have to scale up and the old system just won't do that anymore. We can't buy any more hardware to make it run faster. Um, also that hardware is getting expensive. So we're running our own um, uh, uh, computation centers now. Uh, so there's, maybe hundreds of servers and there's people maintaining them, there's technicians, there's uh, all the, the power consumption and everything. And you add all that up, it's easier to just buy it from someone who does that for a living, right? Um, get to the, the big cloud providers and, and get the cheap virtual hardware to, to do the same stuff that we're now doing on premise. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, the old COBOL prog program can't be maintained anymore because people are just dead. There's no no new COBOL programmers out there. We're, we're not seeing so many COBOL classes in universities anymore. So we have to find a way of replacing the old with something else because otherwise we won't be able to add on any more features. You know, and maybe also it's just grown beyond recognition and we can't add new features anymore because the, the code sucks, um, which is, you know, we all know that it's not something that occurs um, r randomly or rarely. It's something that's very common. So all of these are good reasons to replace a system. And um, why don't we just do that? Why why don't we just you know build the new one and then put it in place of the old one? And you can see here the new Bay Bridge uh, replacing the old one. Um, they're both there, right? Yes. 
the old version that gets uh, shut off. And there's a new version that's in use now, but we're keeping the other one around for a while at least before we tear it down because you know stuff might go wrong. It might not work the way that we we intended. Um, it's very hard to replace infrastructure that's used all the time. It's very hard to uh, put something out of commission without making sure that the new stuff works just as the old stuff did. Um, you want to you know, still keep running your business. You don't want to shut it all down for three months before we start the no, new application. Um, also, we're making the same mistakes again, right? So we're writing the system again, and we think we know everything. But in fact, most of the complex stuff, the, the problems that we actually set out to solve in the first place, the business, that's still there. And that's still just as complex. And we're getting rid of all the old knowledge, so we're making the same mistakes. Um, there's no, no saving us from that, and there's no, no preventing making mistakes. So there's a risk involved in, in this. We want to make sure the new system works. Um, so that replacement will take a long time. That uh, replacement also means that in the meantime, we can't really introduce any new features because otherwise we'll have to do that for both the old and the new version. And we have to keep everything in sync and maintain them both at the same time. And once we transfer the original production data from the old system to the new system, we have to somehow find other ways of keeping them in sync. We can't just keep transferring data back and forth because otherwise things will, you know, the, 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 the application state will break. It'll just be, you know, not working anymore or it's not going to be the same for, for both systems or there was going to be inconsistencies and all kinds of trouble, um, which, which usually means money, right? Um, so in a, especially in, in banking and insurance, everything that you're doing there is money. So any, any error that you're going to have with the data is going to cost you a lot. So this is really hard. Enter the, the, the strangler fig pattern as a replacement method. Um, how are we going to do that? So here's our legacy system. It has colorful parts that do the business. Each of them has a different purpose. Um, and we're going to start by just re replacing the first one, right? So it's it's going to be a new program that does exactly the same thing as the old one, and they're going to be running in parallel for a while. So we're going to intercept any messages that come into the system and go to the blue part, and we're sending to the new blue part and the old blue part the same messages. So for a while, they'll be running at the same time, and we can check that everything works fine. And then we're going to do that for the for the purple part, and we're going to shut off the old blue, right? So eventually we're starving it. We're taking all the, all the messages away that used to go to the old part of the system because now we know the new part works. And then we'll keep doing that, and then we'll keep doing that, and then we'll keep doing that, and eventually it's gonna be the whole system that's been replaced by new parts that are no longer inside of the monolith. They're outside, they're somewhere else. And at that time, we can just switch the old one off and we have a new and modular system that works just the same way that the old one did, or maybe even better. You know, usually there's a, there's a reason for replacing it, so probably we're going to want to improve it. Um, now, there's different ways of doing this. Um, this is the, the concept, um, but we can do this with web traffic, right? So uh, first and most easy version of showing this, you have a, a, a client that connects to a server. You can, can put a gateway, a, a load balancer or something, in between the client and, and the server and intercept the traffic, right? At the beginning, that doesn't change anything. It just passes all the messages through. And then we're going to build a new program that takes part of the traffic. And then we're going to build another. And eventually, we can switch the old stuff off, right? So the, the load balancer in between is really the, the key part of replacing without having any downtime and without having any trouble. Now, another way of doing this would be um, you're, you're running a monolithic application and you still want it to be monolithic, but you want to replace the old stuff, the old code that's entangled and a big ball of mud with a new version that's more modular and modern and you know does everything right and is well-crafted. That's a valid application of this pattern. It doesn't have to be networked. It doesn't have to be a distributed system. This way, um, this one you would do with a facade. 
So basically, you put an interface or a component in between that acts like a like a proxy. Right? It, it, it pretends to be the uh, the big ball of mud, and it passes all the messages through. And then you build a new component that's more modular. And basically, you reroute the messages just as you would with the load balancer, except now it's not uh, network traffic. It's just a method call, right? So um, we're replacing all the bit different parts of the big ball of mud with newer, better versions. And eventually, the big ball of mud goes away. Now, a third way of doing this would be to introduce a message bus. So basically, we have the same setup as in the fir first version, um, where a client connects to a server. Um, now we're putting a message queue in between. So basically, any time we call the original server, it creates a message. It puts that on the message queue, and then it reads that same message back and executes the program logic. Now we're building a new component that in, that gets the same messages, right? So now that's it's. This one's actually easier for duplicating uh, messages and uh, having stuff run in parallel, right? So the message queue makes all of that very easy. And then we're building the next component, and eventually the original one goes away. Now we we only have the the network component, the API, where we intercept the stuff from the client, push to the message queue, and then have the um, individual components pick up wherever they want the message to. Um, to fulfill their purpose. So these are three versions of doing this. I'm sure there's more, right? So it's basically the same thing all over again. Have something in between that intercepts the messages, pass them to new components at the same time, and eventually shut off the old. Now, what happens when we do this? Um, there's consequences, right? Um, Compared to doing a big bang replacement for the whole application, you can just basically forget about downtime, right? So we can do each change incrementally. We can be sure it runs before we shut off the old. We can have zero downtime, so customers won't even notice, or if they notice, they're just because uh, that's just because they're seeing the new features. It's not because um, the, the things failed or we have to um, roll back and you know stuff went wrong and they're they're um, Transactions didn't go through. Um, we can release very frequently. So basically, we can just start doing it today and start pushing changes without having to wait for some release date. Right. So we get a much earlier return on investment for the replacement. Um, we also get quicker feedback. Are we building the right thing? Does it really work better? Right. We, we're going to get an answer to that much more quickly than if we were doing a you know three-year project for the full replacement. Um, also, we might just leave some of the old logic in place. Maybe we don't have to replace the whole system. Maybe just some parts of it need to scale, right? So um, we can be very fine-grained about, about doing these changes. And maybe some part of the old system will still be running in 10 years. Who knows? But we're, we're now able to move, and we're now able to make changes and, and work towards the future, right? Um, also, we can duplicate data by you know, splitting the message, uh, messages, copying the messages without interfering with the state. Basically, the old system and the new system will, will stay in sync just because we made sure that um, our, our uh, application structure allowed for it. Now, of course, there's drawbacks also, right? Um, maybe. Our, both our systems will have to run together for a long time. You know, to replace the whole system will still take years, probably. Um, so we're going to have to have some, you know, budget for that. There might be double cost at least for a while, and and that also might cause some political problems because you know who wants to pay double if they actually want to get cheaper, right? Especially with you know replacing your 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 own. Uh, um, com computers. Um, if you're not able to actually shut the old one off for a while, then you're not saving, you're actually spending more. So you're going to have to find a, a way of explaining that to the superiors. And, you know, some of the data might be problematic as well. Um, I'll get back to that 
when I come to the real life applications later. So there's stuff that could, that could go wrong too. Other, other patterns that will help with doing these kinds of migrations. Um, of course, it's not going to work just by itself, right? So the, I've already mentioned the proxy pattern, um, facade pattern. Those are really old ones. They're very useful. You should definitely know them. Um, that's basically the key. Um, then also I've men mentioned the event interception, which is basically uh, the, the implementation by using a message queue. And um, there's a third one that's called asset capture that basically means in the old system, try to identify um, the things that apply to the same business object or entity, right? So basically identify the, the thing, um, as I mentioned before, so account, right? Everything that concerns account, group all that in the old system before you ap apply the strangler fig pattern and have a new component that applies to accounts. I, that would be a good idea um, so that you can have a more structured um, modular application later on and um, you don't just randomly pull parts of the old system out and replace them with new ones. So these are useful. And, um, and then you start doing it. If it were really this simple, then everybody would be doing it, right? Um, it's not. Um, you, you don't just replace your old stuff um, because nothing is ever as structured as I've shown it before, right? Those colorful uh, uh, dots in the, in the original animation, that's not how legacy code uh, looks and that's no, not how legacy systems look. They're not well structured, which is why you're replacing them. So you have to get rid of a lot of other stuff that's not really related to, um, to the strangler fig pattern. Right. Um, you're, well, the first is obviously political, right? You start working on this and uh, your, your customers or your, your, your stakeholders are going to expect new features first, right? Because replacing the thing that you already have is never as important as having the new stuff that you want, right? So um, if you're not really focused on replacing the old parts, then you're going to end up with that in between state for a really, really long time because you never have time to do the stuff that you actually set out to do um, because people are keeping you busy with the new features, right? Um, also, who decides what we're going to replace and what we're not going to replace? They're doing the same business, right? So what's what's to say we're just leaving it uh, the same way as, as we did before? We can just uh, put new stuff on top. And then, of, of course, you're going to get the distributed big ball of mud, right? Um, it's not going to improve. It's just going to get worse. Quick question. Uh, Jan mm -hmm. Peters is, uh, uh, has a question. Instead of migrating data, you can also let the system bleed to death. What do you think about that? You can let it bleed to death. Uh, you'd probably have to explain what you mean by that, because I'm, I'm not really getting that metaphor. All right, hopefully Jan Peters can can expand on that. Continue then. All right. Um, okay, so of, obviously we have code to deal with, right? So in that original code, there's no well-defined interface. We're going to have to find one before we actually start replacing, right? So we, we're going to have to in, identify um, those bits of, of code that apply to the same business object or that um, fulfill the same capability or that are in some how, uh, way re related so that we can make a small package out of it and then pull it out and replace it by something else. Those small packages aren't in the original code. We have to find them. Um, and then obviously they're written by other people and some of them are gone. So we're gonna have to read the old code and actually have to make sense of it. And sometimes that's not easy. You know, It's not well written, it's cryptic, it has lots of bad comments that are outdated and don't match the code that uh, that appears in the same file. And um, there's documentation that was written 10 years ago that was written for a very old version and it's been changed 10 times in between. So it doesn't really match the, 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 the reality anymore. Um, also, um, I've seen code where 
people were using patterns like the visitor pattern, and they didn't really understand the pattern in the first place. So they're not well implemented. So the, word, uh, the word visitor is all over the place, but it's really not a visitor pattern. So you don't know what, what actually happens in, in uh, place. And you have to basically forensically analyze the thing that you're going to change before you start replacing, right? Just making assumptions will make you go wrong. Now, also, there's part. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to speed up. Um, so there's parts of the system that are hidden, right? So there's business logic in the front end. There's stored procedures in the database. It's not in the in the legacy code application that you're trying to replace, but it's doing things. And if you replace the, the original application, then all of a sudden some connections are lost. Uh, the database isn't updated in places, and you get wrong um, results. So all of this usually happens in legacy systems. Um, here are some, some additional patterns that will help you, right? So there's the seam pattern from, from Michael Feather's awesome book. If you haven't read that, working effectively with legacy code, that's your Bible. You want to read that over and over and over again. It's going to help you great lots. Um, also, the walking skeleton is a, a really useful pattern, even for the legacy replacement. So start by identifying one um, business process that goes through the whole system and uses all parts of it. Replace that one complete value, that the user value stream, uh, with a new version to make sure that you come across all the different parts of the application and all the parts of the ar architecture um, in the first go so that you get rid of the, the additional risk of you know, having half of your system replaced and then finding out you're not really, um, it's not going to work and it, it, you went down the wrong path. Um, hexagonal architecture is great also for this. Um, so use ports and adapters to, to put in the new uh, code in place. Um, and um, there's a, a thing called branch by abstraction. So instead of having the, the branch in your, um, in your versioning system, you can put it in the code. Uh, you can uh, replace um, a, 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 an old uh, component by having an abstract class that, that you implement with a new version and then uh, pull the old one out, put the new one in. Right? And you can work on both at the same time and, and try things out, and you just have to, to uh, switch the instantiations back and forth. You can even do that with, uh, um, with um, dependency injection frameworks for test versions, right? Um, so these will help you. Now, I was going to introduce you to the most horrible code in the world. Um, I'm going to probably skip that because I've already touched on a lot of the issues that will happen. Um, what I can tell you, though, is there's code um, that I've touched in production where all the problems I've, I've talked about before and plenty others actually apply to the same system, the same piece of code, at the same time. So, you know, even worse, there's runtime issues and there's even more problems. So that strangler pattern is not going to save you and you're going to have to, to use all the, the very useful stuff from the legacy uh, code pattern book um, to actually get a grip on this. Um, I'm, I'm just going to skip through the slides so you can read there's a whole, you know, you have no idea how, how bad it's going to be. Um, you know, they're running a virtual file system, so they're basically replacing everything that um, now do, uh, has been being done by uh, a NAS or some other um, actual infrastructure part. Um, and it's all in the same monolithic application um, that runs the front end. Um, the, uh, well, the, the tests are bad, right? So there's a, t a, an, a unit testing component that uh, takes 25 minutes um, to run maybe 50 tests. Why? Because it basically spins up the entire system so that a single unit test can run. That's not a unit test. That's an integrated test, right? And um, if, if, if it's not really readable, then you don't even know what the tests are doing. So you can't really just shut them down or replace them with better ones. Um, I, I Have you ever seen, like, I mean, so they used Hungarian notation. Um, I don't know if you remember that from university. I learned that in 2003, I think, um, when I went back to university. Um, and even at that time, we weren't using it anymore because really IDEs have become so much better. 
um, but it's unreadable. And you know, of course, all the classes are final. You can't ex extend anything. It doesn't lend itself to testing all of that. Not going to work. So that's that big question mark, right? Um, that strangler pattern is really useful, but it's not useful on its own. Um, and I'm going to have to cut it short. I'm, I, I have some other parts pre uh, prepared. I'm sorry for the technical issues that we had before. I hope you still got something out of the session. And um, if you have any more questions, and we can also get into the the um, real life uh, legacy code stuff a bit more in the in the chat. So um, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope um, that uh, the people from Build Stuff are going to do some uh, good with the with the video that we recorded. Um, I'm actually happy to do this over again if you if you like me. Um, Anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tobias. <laughs> uh, yes, truly, apologies for the technical issues as well. Um, there's some uh, a chat going on, uh, quite a bit of a discussion actually started. Uh, so Tobias will be able to read through those questions after his presentation. And uh, you can also join the discussion in the special allocated area. I'm sending the link in right now in the chat, so follow that. And thank you again, and we will come back uh, shortly with the next presentation.